Well, good afternoon. Uh, really happy to be here to uh, go through my presentation, talk about the work of the First Nations Finance Authority. Um, really apologize uh, for the uh, technical difficulties we had a few weeks ago. Um, just wanted to say that it's been a really um, trying uh, week uh, with, the, with the news of the discovery of the mass grave of the 215 um, First Nations children that was discovered uh, late last week. And also uh, the other event that happened last week was all the racist comments made to the Edmonton Oilers uh, hockey player, Ethan Bear, and uh, um, <clears throat> just to acknowledge that. And I understand today was the wrap up of the uh, inquiry into the uh, the death of Joyce uh, Echequan in uh, Quebec, uh, um, where she was at the hospital and subsequently passed away. Just wanted to acknowledge that and uh, yeah, get uh, get right into the uh, uh, presentation. Um, uh, first of all, I, I originate from the Northwest Territories. I'm a member of the Salt River First Nation, um, uh, adjacent to the town of Fort Smith, um, uh, home of uh, Wood Buffalo uh, World Heritage Park, uh, largest free roaming herd of bison in the world, uh, um, grazed there and forage around in the, in the park. Um, and, and it's also the home of the endangered uh, whooping crane. It's the only place they nest, nest in North America. I'm pretty sure it's all over the world. So a very interesting place where I grew up, very small place, uh, a small community, um, isolated for a period of time until we had a full service road. So uh, uh, always um, <clears throat> really uh, honored to say where I came from. Um, and I'm actually call, talking to you today from uh, uh, the West Bank First Nation Reserve, the Okanagan Indian, Indian uh, Band. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I'll get right into this. And I just uh, really a, a quick uh, overview of FNFA and who we are. Uh, we were established in 2005 through an act in Parliament that uh, uh, received all party support and uh, received royal assent in 2005. The, uh, the the whole uh, idea of the act was to promote internal capacity development as well as gain access to to the uh, capital markets so that first nations first nations governments can uh, sorry I just have to move my camera because it's part of it's on the on the uh, on the screen um, so yeah, so th there there were three institutions that were uh, part of the act. There was actually four at, at the start. So the the three that survived were the are the fi uh, First Nations Financial Management Board, the First Takes First Nations Tax Commission, and the First Nations Finance Authority. There was a First Nations Statistical Institute that later got um, eliminated, uh, um, and for reasons that we're not sure of, but uh, we uh, we're looking to resurrect that uh, that element uh, of gathering stats and information, which is really key to the work that we're doing. So the three institutions work together um, to uh, look at integrity of uh, the overall fiscal uh, regime, uh, in particular the work that we do, the FNFA, because um, as I will show you later on, we do oper operate in a pool uh, borrowing. Uh, um, structure and uh, a really significant piece that was later add with later added to the act was a regulation uh, called financing secured by other revenues regulation that that happened in 2011 and this this allowed uh, all first nations to lever leverage all revenues other than property tax the initial uh, act uh, that was uh, came into force in 2005 primarily dealt with uh, property tax in First Nations. So that was very limited uh, to the number of First Nations that actually do this. So this allowed, uh, this gave access to all the First Nations across Canada to really uh, share their, to use their own set of source revenues to uh, uh, gain access to financing. And we, uh, we primarily deal with a lot of provincial revenues um, uh, from different types of uh, arrangements that are in place right now with the different provinces. 
So our mandate is to provide First Nations with access to the same capital market opportunities that um, other level of governments uh, currently uh, have. So up until uh, this act came into force, uh, First Nation governments were only were the only governments in Canada that still went to the commercial banks for financing. Um, so that we operate uh, two types of loan programs. One is a short term a loan program, which is uh, below uh, bank prime. It, it'll all, always be below bank prime. Um, and this is primarily for First Nations that are doing infrastructure projects that need uh, uh, financing uh, until uh, the, uh, the, the project is completed. And also when we're in between our debenture, issuing our debentures, our bonds, uh, which I will explain a bit later, um, and, and the long-term program. So this is uh, fixed rate financing up to, uh, we can do fixed rate financing up to 30 years. The current rate right now, the estimated rate uh, today is 2.75%. Rates have gone up in the last uh, little while, uh, as I'll talk about uh, in, the, in the next few slides. And we also do investment and capital advisory services. So we work with the First Nation to structure, uh, look at restructuring their debt, um, and also um, to for those First Nations that have cash on hand, uh, either through uh, trust arrangements and, and uh, uh, other types of uh, idle cash, uh, we do uh, have an investment in buyer services. So our, 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 our governance model is, uh, is fairly unique compared to the other institutions that uh, operate under the Act. The other institutions, are, other institutions are a shared governance model where uh, the, some organization appoints uh, a minimum um, amount of uh, board members and the governor and council, which is the government, federal government appoints the majority. In our case, uh, we're governed and owned by our, our membership. This is the, the First Nations that become board members with us. And uh, you have to be a chief or a counselor to uh, um, uh, become a board member uh, with FNFA. We uh, we do annual elections um, just to ensure that there's we do have a mix of, uh, of board members that uh, um, just to ensure that there's more integrity into in the system. Of the three, there's 300. Uh, one of the first steps to become a board member is you have to. It's a volunteer. First of all, I should say it's a voluntary act. So. First Nations are not forced to get into this. Uh, they come into this with their eyes wide open. Uh, they want to join and work under the Act. And so of the 634 uh, First Nations, uh, 314 have scheduled, requested schedule and are scheduled under the Act. And of that, 122 have completed the membership steps uh, to become a, a boring member. And, and this, 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 is, this growth is continuing. Uh, we're, we're always adding new uh, board members uh, each um, each month. Uh, just to put it in a different perspective, uh, one of the steps to to uh, like the most important step to become a board member is to work with the First Nations Financial Management Board. In in that process, First Nations have to adopt a financial administration law based on a certain level of standard. It's pretty similar to uh, uh, municipalities. Um, and then they also need to have their financial performance reviewed. Uh, we look at their last five years of uh, audited financial statements and, and they are assessed against uh, certain um, financial ratios. And if they pass that, they're awarded a financial performance certificate. And that enables them to knock on our door. And so it's, it's, a, it's a rigorous process. Um, and uh, it does take First Nations some time to get through the process. Uh, some things we're in control of, some things we're not, like uh, requesting the scheduling. Uh, that's usually done through a request to a B by BCR to the Minister of uh, CERNAC, um, uh, Minister Bennett. And that process can, it's, it's not, we, 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 we don't know sometimes how long that takes. But as I mentioned, we can amortize loans up to 30 years uh, doing fixed rate, uh, fixed interest rate uh, financing. Uh, and one of the other unique uh, uh, elements of our model is uh, we don't charge any uh, loan fees or application fees to our members. We don't uh, generally take collateral on any assets. Uh, we're not bonused. Uh, I, 
personally, I don't get a bonus or any of our staff. We, we don't have any commissions um, because we're, we're, we're a not-for-profit uh, uh, model. And so uh, we're not working to try to get loans out the door because that could uh, um, have a, a sort of a negative effect on, on, on the borrowing pool. Uh, as I'll mention later, this is a uh, <clears throat> this is a really interesting slide. This is show shows our progression to really where we are today. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, we received the oral assent. Uh, the act uh, got passed in Parliament, and the other revenues regulation came into force in 2011. And from from that 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 was a major turning point was getting this other revenues regulation in place. <clears throat> so in 2014. Uh, after we uh, um, uh, really started uh, getting First Nations certified and through the door, we issued our first debenture, and that was in 2014. It was $90 million, and the interest rate at that time was 3.79%, which, which was a very good rate at that time. And our, our, our initial credit rating was an A3. It was an A3 stable plus uh, with uh, Moody's and uh, uh, a minus stable with uh, Standard and Poor's, so pretty good, uh, pretty good um, credit rating for um, a, a new issuer. And uh, we were sl uh, we slotted in in a municipal uh, index. Uh, <clears throat> shortly after that, a few years later, we uh, we actually got a, a credit rating upgrade. Uh, went to an A2 stable uh, with Moody's from A3 and an A plus stable with Standard and Poor's. That that's that was actually a, a big jump. That was two notches. Uh, so it was very very good for us. Um, <clears throat> so really, what why we got that increase in the rating was that the investors are uh, that we had talked to and educated about uh, the act and all the services we do, um, uh, really accepted our, our credit story. It, it, uh, and we actually had uh, international uh, investors uh, other than, other than uh, Can uh, Canada and the US uh, into Europe and in, in the Middle East. So uh, our, our, our credit story was uh, well, well accepted amongst the investors. In 2018, we were uh, nominated and uh, awarded the Governor General Award uh, for Innovation uh, in Finance. Uh, this was actually really, really good for us to receive because uh, we weren't nominated. It was nominated by one of one of the banking uh, people that we work with uh, um, put it put it forward, and uh, uh, because our, our financing model was uh, was so new and it was actually very inno innovative at the time. Uh, because there's no other um, type of First Nations finance authority that exists for Indigenous people anywhere else in the world. Just, it's just here in Canada. And fast forward to 2020, uh, we issue, from issuing our first debenture in 2014, so that's six years, we, we issued our, our eighth debenture just uh, last, uh, last year. Um, so that, that, that's, it was quite... Uh, um, an increase in the, the work that we had did. And you can see at the same time last year, uh, this was just when COVID was happening, uh, we had another upgrade to our rating with uh, Moody's investors to an AA3, so a double A rating, which was a uh, two notch increase, which is, was really good. So this is, uh, we had two rating upgrades since, uh, upgrades since uh, 2014. Um, and you can look at our, our uh, interest rate at the time was 1.9%, uh, and it was our biggest venture to date of $354 million. So today, uh, as I'm speaking to you today, we reached $1.5 billion. So quite an accomplishment uh, from the 90 million that we issued uh, back in 2014. Uh, this is just another look at uh, how the loans were distributed across Canada. Uh, I highlighted BC because I think most of the audience there is from BC. Um, and, and the fact that uh, the act primarily started with uh, BC First Nations, um, um, as I mentioned, that, uh, um, that the act started with property taxing First Nations and most of them are in BC. So uh, when we look at uh, the uh, the distribution across Canada, if you would have looked at this in 2014, there would have been a lot of zeros in some of the other provinces. Uh, so we pretty well have 
all the provinces uh, and territories participating. The, you don't see anything for the Yukon because the way the act is structured, uh, the eligible uh, First Nation that can uh, become a member are Indian Act First Nations. So in, in the Yukon, the, the majority of the First Nations there are self-governing. And uh, I'll talk about that a bit later. So <clears throat> when we look at the, the, the total loans and how that translates into jobs that are created is it's, 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 uh, it's just over 16,000, almost uh, 17,000 uh, jobs created. Uh, this is using uh, Stats Canada's employment multiplier formula. And we try to measure the economic impact, uh, which is about just over $3 billion. So it's pretty significant uh, for this uh, um, amount of loans that have gone out to, when you look at it, there's 76 First Nations that have acquired a loan with us. So you can just imagine if uh, all 100, uh, we're, we're at 124 members now. Uh, I, I updated this just the other day. So if all 124 were borrowing, the numbers would almost double. And if, uh, if all the 314 that are scheduled, well, you can imagine what the economic impact uh, and the jobs that have been created out, uh, uh, from, from First Nations acquiring financing through to us. So this is just, you know, another way to look at the, the impact that uh, First Nations and First Nations are making to the economy in Canada, in particular, the different provinces. So if I look at BC, uh, there's well over 2,000 jobs created and the economic impact is about $452 million. So it's, it's significant. So what kind of projects do we lend for? Well, other than uh, um, the, re the strict requirements under property tax uh, um, revenues, uh, First Nations can really do a wide uh, selection of, of uh, projects from economic development to social development and equity involvement uh, into uh, various projects. Um, <clears throat> Uh, for example, power, green energy projects. Uh, they can do land purchases, uh, infrastructure, um, and rolling stock uh, vehicles and equipment. So it's pretty wide open. Uh, if it doesn't fit under economic development or social development, uh, I'd be surprised. So uh, yeah, so it's uh, it's it's wide open. Uh, and uh, one of the other elements of our model is that. The, the First Nations revenues determine its foreign capacity. So um, the other revenues regulation that I talked about uh, identifies a certain types of re eligible revenues that can be leveraged uh, for financing. And there, there's, there's a list of them there. There's um, anything from contract revenues, business revenues, royalties, and transfer some other government uh, uh, independent power project revenues. So this is uh, this is the, another way to kind of look at this. Is uh, um, I'm, I'm sure a lot of you have a have a mortgage with your house, um, and that mortgage was really the more the amount that you could borrow was really determined by your salary. So this is in a sense the same type of parallel uh, with the First Nations in terms of their own source revenue. So this I, I have to say this is their own source revenue. That they that they generate uh, from the different arrangements. Uh, <clears throat> there's a number of safeguards in place, um, and this is really is to keep the integrity of the borrowing pool, um, which I'll talk about in a few slides. Uh, <clears throat> as I mentioned, the First Nations Financial Management Board, their certif certification process is is really key to this. Uh, this is this, this really ensures that all the First Nations are on the same level playing field. So they, they adopt the financial administration law and they meet all the financial ratios. And the other thing is that we don't really work in a vacuum. We work with the capital markets. Uh, this is all the financial arms of the, the, all the banks in Canada work with us. So they, they, we work with them in the beginning to uh, look at the different leverage factors for each revenue stream. So not all, all revenue streams are, are, are equal in the sense of how much they can leverage uh, into uh, uh, financing. We, we establish a, a few reserve funds. Uh, this is all under the Act. Uh, so for every every loan that a First Nation borrows from us, they, they need to either contribute 
5% of that or more additional 5%. And that goes into a debt reserve fund, the DRF. And so that 5% sits there until the loan is actually repaid. And the whole purpose of that is to, if there's ever a problem with the revenue stream or revenue streams, uh, we can dip into the debt reserve fund to, uh, to, uh, <clears throat> to bring it up to, uh, uh, to current and, and out of default. So it's, that, that's really important. And uh, where we're sitting now is uh, <clears throat> about $60 million in this debt reserve fund. And also uh, there's a credit enhancement fund called the CEF. So this uh, credit enhancement fund is uh, established uh, with the funding from uh, the government of Canada, because being a new issuer, we needed some type of equity uh, going into uh, uh, the capital markets and gaining the credit rating that we got. So uh, Canada has uh, funded 40, Two million, I believe, so far uh, to date, uh, which is pretty good. So, a combination of the debt reserve fund and the CEF is well over uh, 100 million, which uh, which is really the sweet spot where we want to be. Uh, and I mentioned that our our board is made up of the borrowing members, um, which are elected annually. So, the borrowing members approve each other's uh, loan requests, and uh, they also approve who can become a member. So, they kind of self police each other just to ensure the integrity of the boring pool. And, and, a, and another unique uh, safeguard that we have in place is it's called a trust account system. This ensures that the uh, loan payments are paid. Another name is called lockbox. So, so what this, uh, what this uh, system does is uh, uh, with, with a, an agreement with the First Nation and uh, um, a trust company, in this case, we use computer share, um, we, uh, we agree for the term of the loan that uh, revenue sources to, that, are, that are used to, uh, um, <clears throat> uh, to back loans are, are intercepted. So it's intercepted before it goes to the First Nation. So the revenue, if, it's a, if there's a revenue uh, coming from, a, say, an independent uh, uh, um, uh, <clears throat> energy project, uh, like a, a green energy project, like a hydro or wind, or there's usually long-term uh, contracts with those. It gets intercepted, uh, the, the, the payments get intercepted uh, before it goes to the First Nation. And then the loan payments are, are made first and any balance goes back to the First Nation. So, <clears throat> well, how, how do we access the capital markets? And as I mentioned, we have two uh, uh, independent uh, credit ratings from uh, worldwide credit rating uh, agencies. Uh, Moody's in our case and S&P uh, uh, provide the, the two ratings for us. And uh, um, I mentioned earlier that uh, we have a double A, it's AA3 uh, with Moody's and an A plus with, uh, with S&P. And those are really, uh, really good uh, ratings. Um, <clears throat> Now here's the here is how the debenture process works and and how the borrowing pool works. So with, with our credit rating, which is based on the First Nations own source revenues, um, all the safeguards we have in and the structure of the uh, the act and uh, our management that's in place. Uh, but that credit rating, uh, First Nation, we can go to the capital markets and to borrow the money that First Nations are requesting. So we normally, uh, in all cases, well, well, in all cases, uh, First Nations make loan requests to us. Uh, they either borrow through our interim financing program, um, and uh, when we get to a certain dollar amount, we actually go to the capital markets. So the borrowing pool is made up all the First Nations loans. So in our case, <coughs> excuse me, uh, we wait till uh, we get to at least a hundred and 50 to 200 million dollars in loan requests uh, before we actually go uh, to the capital markets and uh, uh, and get investors to buy our bond. So uh, <clears throat> we do that because it puts us in a different uh, category of investors. And that that translates into better rates for our, our members. So once we have this together, our, our board approves this uh, this debenture, this First Nations Finance Authority debenture, uh, for whatever dollar amount is. Uh, for instance, the last one we had was three hundred fifty-four million dollars. 
We work with a, with a banking syndicate, as, as I mentioned earlier, it's uh, made up of all the financial arms of uh, all the major banks across Canada, plus two smaller ones, uh, Casgreen and Laurentian in this case. And the reason why we do that, it, it just really keeps the, the bigger guys honest uh, because they can uh, gang up on us and, uh, and uh, we end up at a higher rate for our members, but uh, the smaller ones actually keep that uh, uh, in, in check. And so uh, up until a few years ago, we took the risk of selling this, um, but now uh, we, since, since we've actually reached a certain size and uh, our, our credit uh, story is accepted uh, worldwide, uh, they actually take the risk now and sell this to investors. So uh, once we issue uh, our bond, uh, we know that it's sold and it generally sells for really favorable uh, terms for ourselves. And it's usually sold to uh, institutional investors like pension plans, life insurance companies, uh, mutual funds, other governments. Uh, for instance, the government of BC makes uh, an investment. Uh, they were one of the first investors that bought our first venture and they continue to do that as we issue, which, uh, which is really good. So uh, this is a snapshot of how the whole system works and how, how we get the money. Um, <clears throat> this is another way of looking at when we're talking to investors, um, because there's a lot of uh, um, uh, um, issues now with the ESG bonds and uh, uh, this is an environmental uh, aspects of uh, uh, type of projects that we're financing. We, uh, we generally like to uh, <clears throat> mention uh, that we're investing into a lot of social values. So, you know, being that we're a not-for-profit or not -for -profit organization, which really leads to in sustainable indigenous development. And the mission, the whole mission is to uh, helping First Nation communities build their own futures on their own terms. So this is really important because um, First Nations don't have to rush into this. They they can take their time on how they're doing this. And they actually, as as they need to uh, um, financing to uh, address their community priorities, uh, they do it on their own times. And, uh, and it's based on the values of empowerment, leadership, and integrity. And <clears throat> so you can look at all the different types of uh, infrastructure uh, projects we finance from community facilities, um, to sustainable power, local business, and a lot of public uh, infrastructure in, in, in the communities, and, and also housing and uh, other aspects. So just, you know, looking at the measurable impacts, uh, as I mentioned, there's uh, pretty close to $17,000 jobs, uh, 17,000 jobs, sorry, <laughs> getting ahead of myself, uh, $3.2 billion in the economic impact. and. Uh, you know, this is uh, all underpinned by the awards and the recognition that we get uh, for really the, the success, successful model of the, uh, that we work with under the uh, First Nation Fiscal Management Act. <clears throat> um, I wanna switch a bit now and talk uh, about a few projects. And uh, I, I'm not too sure how many uh, have heard about this one. Is, um, so this one is, uh, uh, there were seven Mi'kmaq communities that formed a coalition in the Atlantic uh, to buy 50% of uh, clear, clear water seafoods. And this they done in partnership with premium bands, which, uh, brands, which is based in uh, BC. Uh, resulting in now the, the coalition, uh, <clears throat> another aspect of this deal was uh, uh, the First Nations having ownership of all the outstanding lobster fishing licenses, uh, which was really an important part of this deal. Uh, and uh, this this is the element uh, the, that of, of the deal that the First Nations Finance Authority finance for two hundred and fifty million dollars um, spread amongst the seven communities. They now own all the lobster fishing licenses, which was owned by uh, Clearwater Seafoods before. <clears throat> so. What this means is that there's a lot of jobs um, for uh, indigenous fisher uh, fisher people, and uh, um, and it creates uh, other uh, uh, um, private uh, business ownership and small business. Uh, <clears throat> so the, the the billion dollar deal uh, uh, is structured in such a way that premium brands um, 
has financed the remainder of the deal under a subordinated debt agreement. So, so what this means is that the, the premium brands has financed the, uh, the seven uh, communities uh, uh, <clears throat> equity stake in this partnership and uh, that will become due in a few years and I'm sure that they'll refinance uh, with, with us. But uh, this, this, is a, this was a real groundbreaking deal for uh, Indigenous people to work as a group to take a major um, interest in uh, such a, uh, uh, I guess, a, a, a large uh, company that's, uh, it, I know it's the largest seafood company in North America. And so um, it, 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 it was really, it received a lot of uh, press and a lot of attention and rightly so because uh, this, this has now developed a path through the FNFA for groups of First Nations to participate really in similar types of investments. And uh, uh, we've been, ever since the, then, we've been inundated with a number of, uh, of uh, uh, projects uh, uh, that would include uh, groups of First Nations to, um, to look at getting into. So uh, I'll, I'll talk about another one in a second, but what was really important uh, and made this deal successful was uh, the the executive team. Uh, uh, our executive team was able to discuss in advance uh, with the the lending sy uh, syndicate on how this deal would be structured, and also uh, all the uh, the First Nations leadership staff and their professionals had the skills to execute a transaction that's pretty complex, and. Really, uh, this this uh, that this was really one of the key ingredients uh, to this successful uh, acquisition. Uh, it is really important, and it's it's sometimes in a lot of cases missing uh, uh, in in our uh, First Nations community is the capacity required to look at so complex uh, deals and uh, and opportunities. So, you know, if, if there's anything that could happen in the future for the positive is to First Nations to get this type of uh, capacity uh, in place uh, as they need it, uh, as they need. Um, and also, uh, uh, it, it, it required all the First Nations to become a boring member, which made it really easy uh, and, and to spread the risk, which is, which is always uh, really important in terms of a pool, a pool boring uh, model. Um, and this is, I'm, I'm, I'm going to move a bit to BC now, focus on BC. Uh, uh, I'm sure that uh, a lot of you are aware of uh, the coastal gas link pipeline that uh, TC Energy is, uh, is uh, currently uh, working on and constructing. Um, so back a few years ago, TC Energy made an offer to 20 First Nations in BC to acquire a 10% equity in the coastal gas pipeline. It was actually more, uh, it was, uh, it was 10, it was 20%, uh, but uh, the First Nations couldn't meet the timelines. Uh, so we, uh, this, it, it, this, this, is, this is a really unique project because it's in the best interest of uh, the BC government to get this uh, project up and running uh, uh, for a number of reasons, um, um, purely economical and uh, really uh, to get our, our, our gas to the uh, other markets, uh, international markets. So we, we actually started discussions with uh, the BC government, uh, TC Energy and the Major Projects Coalition. Uh, this is a, it's a First Nations Major Projects Coalition that uh, really tries to uh, um, be that capacity that's needed in the communities to look at uh, these type of, uh, of um, opportunities on behalf of First Nations. So a majority of the 20 are working under the major projects coalition. And uh, there's, um, I think, uh, six or eight uh, that are working independently uh, to TC Energy. So we've had discussions with them and it became pretty evident that FNFA is, is seen as the best financing opportunity for these nations to become owners of this uh, project. Just being that our, our rates are, 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 are very low compared to any other ones that uh, uh, that they could actually get. Uh, matter of fact, I, I know they went out and they had up, upwards to 50 offers, uh, potential offers on financing if they even could get it. And there was 
really one or two that came through that would uh, would uh, uh, consider uh, providing financing, and those were around 10% uh, interest rates, which made the project really not feasible. Uh, <clears throat> compared to our rate, our current rate today of 2.75, it's 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 a huge difference and a game changer for First Nations when it comes to uh, getting um, uh, revenue from a project through equity ownership. So the financing is expected to be completed once the construction is uh, completed in about three years. So we are working right now with all the all the 20 First Nations and seeing seeing if we can actually have everything in place beforehand and, and we can just move forward with that. So really exciting project for those 20 First Nations in BC. Uh, this is just a recent, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, this, was, this project was just uh, recently announced uh, a few weeks ago, last month actually, um, and it, 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 was a, it took uh, some time to get it uh, up and running, and it's, it's, it's the first uh, housing project with BC housing that's going to be situated on reserve. And it, uh, it's going to be 23 townhouses uh, with, with the combination of one, two or three bedrooms and, uh, and a common building. So uh, yeah, so this, this actually is, is a groundbreaking uh, project because it does pave the road uh, for other First Nations to work with BC housing for similar type of projects. Uh, during uh, some of the work that they were looking at for the the land that was uh, uh, <clears throat> that the Acton First Nation was going to uh, donate towards the project, uh, they discovered the environmentally protected. It was a it was a it was a these Oregon forest snails, which is a picture on the screen. Um, <clears throat> that's where they were habitat, and so. Uh, as a result of that, uh, it was identified, and so they made it into a protected area, which is which is very good. Um, <clears throat> so this uh, this is really exciting project, and uh, it really puts First Nations in a better position to uh, be involved in the designing and um, uh, of the housing and uh, all the different landscape and how how the the project will be uh, um, <clears throat> uh, built and what requirements will all be in place. So the, the financing co concept is, uh, there's a number of funders involved in this. So the, the, the Acting First Nation did receive uh, funding from uh, CMHC, uh, Indigenous Services Canada, and they contributed some of their own. Uh, they invested in the, the professionals, uh, the engineering, general contractors, uh, financial forecasters, the project management, um, and they also contributed the land and um, dollars towards a total $5 million investment in this project. So as I mentioned, uh, ISC provided infrastructure funding, CMHC and BC housing, one-time grants, um, and BC housing will provide rent subsidies like they do with uh, a lot of their projects in BC for the term of the, mo uh, the mortgage. Um, so we've, uh, <clears throat> we are actually going to be financing the $5 million uh, remaining balance, uh, which is a remaining balance in this project, and uh, so that's uh, that was all completed uh, a few weeks ago, and uh, and construction is expected to start in the in the fall of this year, and the agreement uh, was signed with BC Housing. So, really new and groundbreaking project, and uh, should bode well for uh, all First Nations in BC that want to do something similar. Um, <clears throat> So since uh, really the success of the Clearwater uh, project, uh, we've, re we've uh, as I mentioned, we've been inundated with a lot of different requests. And it, it's, it, it's not only from the Clearwater, but really the success that FNFA has been having. And um, so a lot of First Nations and tribal councils are looking to form part partnerships similar to the uh, Clearwater projects. Uh, corporate entities are looking to sell uh, some of their existing businesses or parts of their existing businesses, and they're looking for an opportunity for First Nations to partner and uh, and to uh, um, <clears throat> uh, acquiring uh, equity. And also, can the consultants are trying to understand us, our process, and governments as well are are, are really uh, looking into how we're operating and because our success is not. But it's 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 not going unnoticed, and uh, so 
those are the re main reasons why. And so we are constantly dealing with this. We, we've actually added more capacity to our staff. We hired seven people in the last uh, eight months or so. So uh, really trying to keep up with uh, uh, all the uh, different requests that are coming in. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, as I mentioned, uh, there, there are more reasons why that we're, we're getting a lot of these requests. And uh, at, the, at the bottom there of the slide, you can see that the Clearwater uh, project really provide a lot, a lot of attention for a lot of groups uh, looking to do similar types of arrangements. And First Nations are really looking to share risk as opportunities uh, to that uh, for opportunities uh, on their traditional territories. Um, and also, you know, just the fact that the FNFA is uh, really being seen now as the benchmark for uh, financing uh, for First Nations because uh, our late our rates are very 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 low and uh, very uh, competitive and so I, I think that you know um, uh, first nations industry uh, are really and businesses in general are looking to capitalize on that so uh, uh, yeah uh, some of the other things we're working on uh, and this is to uh, really uh, Again, I you know I mentioned the the other revenues regulation that came into force in 2011. The act has regulation making powers to uh, include other uh, borrowing members, uh, including self uh, government, uh, self governing First Nations, and the BC Treaty First Nations. So we're expecting Section 141 regulation to be completed uh, uh, later this year and hopefully uh, come into force. Uh, Either by the end of the year or early uh, early next year, and so this really opens it up uh, to a number of uh, I think there's uh, 26 or so self-governing First Nations in Canada right now, and because uh, uh, at, at the current time they really don't have any place to go and access financing, um, and so uh, this it's really important that we we actually complete this and get them uh, uh, to be eligible members. And one of the other um, parts of what, uh, Section 141 of the Act is to expand our, our membership again to other uh, First Nations not-for-profit organizations, uh, for example, health centers, education authorities, uh, water authorities, um, health authorities. Um, because right now, uh, a, a lot of these um, institutions really need access to capital for uh, infrastructure. And, and other needs that they have, and uh, there's really no place for them to go. <clears throat> um, I just want to switch again here to talking about UNDRIP. Uh, as the federal government, the provinces are looking at uh, implementing uh, UNDRIP in their different ways. Uh, uh, they're they're looking at action plans to uh, how, how how each province or the federal government will uh, will imp implement UNDRIP, and. One of the things it's uh, you know, for us uh, is uh, to really build on our successes and not to try to reinvent the wheel. Uh, for instance, uh, if there's a another type of FNFA that comes on, well, it's just going to really di uh, dilute the, the market, and uh, you just won't be able to get the same type of uh, rates for and and uh, terms for our members. So that's that's really important for these governments to to know. Um, and to ensure that there's access by self-governing Indigenous groups, because the whole purpose of UNDRIP is to move uh, First Nations into more of a self, where they're self-governing and looking after their own uh, uh, government activities. Um, so we just got to continue to make sure that uh, we're, revol we're evolving in the same direction, the same way, um, and also to secure, uh, do revenue sharing agreements, benefit agreements, uh, uh, across all the provinces, because one of the articles under UNDRIP is that uh, the senior, the state governments uh, uh, um, is recommended to share different revenues because, uh, you know, 80% of the revenues that uh, First Nation, the First Nations that are borrowing from us right now are utilizing our revenue sharing agreements with provinces, uh, mainly provinces, uh, uh, very few from the federal government. Um, but it's but it actually does help. So in BC, for for example, the a few years ago, uh, the BC government announced a revenue sharing arrangement 
to uh, to a gaming revenues that the province is involved in. And it was a 20 year agreement uh, sharing um, about $2 billion. And so if you, you look at what you can leverage in that with $2 billion, that's about $18 billion. And, you know, just thinking again about uh, the impact to the economy, uh, BC benefits a lot from this by, by doing this. So uh, yeah, for the 2 billion that they are sharing, uh, the impact uh, to the uh, BC economy is probably 10 times that. Um, and also uh, really to maximize the benefits of pooling because uh, there's no First Nations that can actually go to the capital markets on their own. They're just not big enough to do that on a regular basis to garner uh, any preferential uh, interest rates. And um, and to uh, also to uh, get the government to look at considering uh, purchasing our, our bonds. Uh, so I just want to move now to some photos. Uh, this is the uh, uh, renderings of uh, the BC housing project. So uh, this is in the uh, uh, Yakin First Nation in in, uh, in Kamloops. I mean uh, Chilliwack. Sorry, I got Kamloops on the brain. Uh, <clears throat> This is a uh, Taka River Tinklet, uh, Clinklet in uh, northern BC. This this project was done a few years ago. Uh, was a, uh, what's unique about this uh, this project is that Taka River is totally off the grid. So they were able to convince uh, BC Hydro to allow them to uh, build this uh, this dam. Um, <clears throat> forget how many megawatts it is, but to replace the diesel. Uh, uh, generators that were in the communities uh, uh, that uh, were really uh, not, not environmentally friendly. So, so they're able to do this uh, with uh, with that uh, contract with BC Hydro, and now they're looking at expanding this uh, this this hydro and uh, the hydro project and selling some of their power to the Yukon government. So, it, it, it's uh, it's on a smaller scale, but uh, you can see that. Uh, opportunities for exp expansion will will really help them uh, um, generate additional revenues. Uh, this is uh, in Manitoba, uh, First Nation called Long Plain First Nation, uh, built uh, 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 on their lands, uh, a microtel uh, uh, hotel uh, that opened in 2019. And what, what's really unique about this is that uh, Long Plain is uh, uh, located near Portage La Prairie, uh, right, right adjacent to it. And um, by having this hotel built uh, so close to Portage La Prairie, it enabled Portage La Prairie to uh, really expand their uh, capacity to hold events like uh, uh, Scotty's and uh, Tim Hortons, Briars, for those curlers out there. Uh, but uh, it, so it increased the, the number of bedrooms that were available to host events. And so it put them on that, that, uh, that playing field. Uh, which was, which I thought was a really good thing. Uh, it's a great partnership between the the community and the First Nation. And this is a, a large project, wind farm project in uh, Ontario. Um, uh, the Henby Inlet uh, First Nation uh, became a 50% owner in this uh, major project. It's a 300 megawatt wind farm. It has 87 turbines, the largest in the world. Um, and it actually resulted in 90 kilometers of transmission, 80 kilometers of networks of roads, two electrical substations, and it it powers uh, over 100,000 homes in Ontario with uh, with clean energy. Uh, so that concludes my uh, my my presentation. Um, I'm going to show you a short uh, video, so I'll just turn over. Uh, or I'll ask uh, Chris to uh, show a video that we recently we recently launched uh, just last week. So, uh, Chris, I'll just turn it back to you.
Chris, I, I don't know if we could hear the sound. and will generate revenue for the community and its members for generations to come. These loans help communities build the necessary infrastructure that's really required in their, in their communities. It also enables them to really build on their economic development. As the CEO of the Bayside Development Corporation on the Butnikeg Mi'kmaq Nation, Rose Paul is determined to help rebuild the economy in her community. She keeps a letter from a federal Indian agent sent back in 1963, warning the First Nation that no commercial activity would be permitted near the provincial highway that cut their territory in two, aside from making baskets. I keep that letter very near and dear to me just to keep my fire lit. That fire has inspired Rose and her community to build the Bayside Travel Center along the new highway interchange at Butnikay with the support of an FNFA loan. It includes facilities for gaming, a service station, a convenience store, restaurants, and even a tourism center. I've been telling other people that never give up, never give up on their economic development goals and their First Nation or any community development goal, whether it be housing or infrastructure, capital projects. It could be done. It's doable, and it's doable with the help of the First Nation Finance Authority. For Member 2 and the other members of the Mi'kmaq Coalition, it means that future generations will always have jobs. Jobs that Chief Paul says will range from a deckhand to a CEO and a major stake in a global company. We are owners and we are participants and uh, FNFA truly has brought us there. It is uh, run by Indigenous people, so uh, that, that's a plus uh, in my mind. FNFA loans have financed infrastructure, which have now created over 14,000 jobs and have contributed almost $3 billion in economic activity. For our members, accessing capital knocks down barriers and is a critical step towards self-determination and exercising our rights. I see a great partnership. I see First Nations taking a rightful place in this economy and actually being a major contributor to the economy. There remains a $30 billion infrastructure gap between First Nations and the rest of Canada and an urgent need to build more housing, schools, health and water treatment facilities and other economic development projects. From the bottom of my heart in my communities, we thank you for working with us on this to see a long-time vision finally come to life. Thank you, First Nation Finance Authority. Our success is due to the First Nation governments who take the necessary step to join us. We have an incredibly talented team and we look forward to hearing from you. So contact us today. We are the First Nation Finance Authority and we are for First Nations by First Nations. And we are stronger together. Igwech. <laughs>
get started or anything. Um, question. Sorry, Chris, I can't hear uh, can't hear you very well. Novice mistake. Oh, okay, now I could. <laughs> I had to swing down my uh, microphone. Um, so a question then, uh, as the number of First Nations participating in the Finance Authority grows, so must the number of ideas as to what the money could be used for. Um, how does the finance authority go about managing this and the potential that it um, could increase risk in the borrowing pool? Well, that's a really good question. Uh, so, uh, so there's a potential of 600 plus First Nations becoming involved in this. Uh, and if we actually uh, increase the membership to include uh, uh, other not-for-profit uh, corporations, that number can really uh, increase significantly. Uh, so, <clears throat> well, one one of the things is uh, there's a number of uh, safeguards we have in our system, and 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 one is that we don't lend on uh, with the hope of a, of a project generating revenue. First Nations need to have existing revenues in place uh, to secure a loan for a project. Uh, that doesn't mean that the revenue that they, they can generate from, uh, um, say, Clearwater doesn't become an eligible uh, for increasing their borrowing power later on. Uh, so, so that so that's one thing. And the other is that we uh, we use uh, in our in our financing model, uh, First Nations are required to uh, uh, repay their debts based on a, on a, certain ratios. So depending on the revenue stream, um, in some cases they have to pay, uh, um, if, if it's a government source revenue, they pay about 1.25% uh, to us. Uh, and we, we, we end up keep, we end up just uh, using the amount that's due to us, but the remainder goes back to them within a certain time frame. And so for individual businesses uh, that are, are, are band owned businesses like uh, your gas store and your corner store and those type of things. Uh, business revenues, uh, we collect 1.75%. Uh, uh, so this is in case there's ever a problem, we do have some margin um, to, uh, to service the debt. And, the, and the, other, the other thing is the more First Nations that join, the greater they, they will spread the risk. Um, so it's 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 a positive. We actually want more to uh, to uh, join. And the other the other thing is that it does once once there's more joining and we're and we're accessing the capital markets more often, it's going to lead to a better rating in our in our credit rating. Our goal is to get to a triple A rating. We're at the double A right now. By getting to a triple A, we we will reduce uh, the the financing cost to a First Nation. So the so the debt coverage ratios um, are, are are depending on the different revenue stream, and uh, the other thing is the intercept mechanism of intercepting the revenue uh, and the debt reserve funds that we have in place uh, really reduce the risk. We haven't had any any First Nation default on a loan or with late payments uh, to date, and uh, it's really it's, it's it's actually really really good. Uh, that uh, that we we haven't had that because uh, the minute we do then you know that really can uh, uh, um, identify uh, potential problems but no plus we we're, we're continually adding on the capacity we need to to ensure we're doing the the due diligence that's required uh, to look at each and every loan it's it's the, the the source and the dependability of the revenue stream which is really important to us Plus, being uh, 
certified through the Financial Management Board and having the financial administration a lot really does uh, lessen the risk. So, mm. Long-winded answer, but there are many elements to uh, how we address risk. I think that's a function of your depth of experience and knowledge. Um, uh, Greg, uh, do you have questions from the audience at this point? Yes, Chris, we do. We actually have a, a question from Ricardo Toledo. And Ricardo's request, um, Ernie, is if you could speak more about leverage ratios for revenue sharing agreements. And are there are there some revenue sharing uh, agreements viewed more favorably by capital markets? And what are some of the factors that are considered? Uh, yeah, another, another good question. Uh, so uh, revenue streams uh, to, uh, to revenue sharing agreements that come from the provinces in Canada are, are, are pretty safe, safe bet that the province or, or, the, or Canada will, will honor these uh, uh, agreements, uh, like the BC gaming one, for instance. So those have high leverage factors. Uh, so which is about 12 times, 12 to 14 times uh, what that is. Uh, and uh, independent power, uh, power projects generally come with a, a 20 year, 25 year, 30 year, in some cases, 40 year contract. So the longer the duration of the contract, uh, the less risk there is. And in those cases, the, the, uh, the um, leverage factor is about 1.6, uh, or uh, sorry, yeah. So it's about, it's a little less than what uh, you can uh, leverage from the federal government. And of course, if you start to go down to some of the like contracts, uh, <clears throat> contracts sometimes uh, are 10 years, or if they're 20 years, well, then they're pretty solid in some cases. But the way we look at it is that it, it's a lot more riskier than uh, the federal government and provincial governments in terms of uh, revenue, revenue, revenue uh, sharing agreements. So. Uh, obviously, some provinces are, are better off than some other ones, but uh, they will, we, we, the capital markets are pretty uh, confident that provinces are going to live up to their obligations uh, in, in these revenue sharing agreements. Um, I, I, I have to mention that uh, uh, with the budget uh, that was recently announced by Canada, the, they're going through the budget implementation bill right now, and in there, uh, they made available uh, two other uh, uh, revenue uh, um, sources that First Nations have that weren't eligible for financing through the FNFA before. And one is the, there's a number of First Nations that have arrangements to share First Nations goods and services tax. And so that that is part of the budget bill. So uh, uh, <clears throat> those are, would be considered a high leverage factor. And and these were uh, these were actually developed in conjunction with the capital markets, so the banking syndicate that we worked with. Uh, that's that's how we came up with the, these different leverage factors. Ernie, we have a follow-on question from Larry Olson. And Larry's asking, how do you manage debt to equity ratios when financing an acquisition Without access to the equity capital usually required to keep balance sheets, as you said, in balance. And um, what are the ways in which you work with these deals in terms of being the leveraging and whether or not you know there's concerns about being over leveraged? Well, we did a good question. <clears throat> I'll answer the last part of it first is that uh, uh, based on the First Nations uh, own source revenue, that really determines their borrowing capacity. And we, as a rule, our board has uh, mandated us to not lend more than 75% of that, that available borrowing capacity. So we don't want the First Nations to over borrow. And uh, uh, so the, the other part uh, of the discussion is, uh, so our debt, uh, our, our debt equity uh, uh, is uh, a function of the debt reserve fund that we have in place uh, where the First Nations pay 5% of uh, of their uh, loan into a debt reserve fund until the loan is paid off and the credit enhancement fund. Uh, that in, in conjunction with the available um, own source revenues that the First Nations are pledging towards the loan uh, really make up the, the debt, the equity. 
So as I mentioned, we do have over $100 million right now in, in the two reserve funds. And uh, those can be used uh, when, when there's a impairment to a, a revenue stream uh, on behalf of a First Nation. Uh, and again, we do uh, we do work with uh, the uh, a banking syndicate that uh, reviews this information as well, and uh, the credit the credit rating uh, agencies uh, look at this in terms of to make sure that we do have the required amount of debt equity in place. Um, so those are really important for us. So maintaining the integrity of the borrowing pool uh, to make sure that revenue streams are maintaining uh, themselves in terms of being able to service that is really important because uh, we don't want to trigger any uh, accessing of the debt reserve fund um, that because that does usually signal a problem and so we don't generally lend to a first nation with a single revenue source they usually they usually have a multiple of revenue streams that in case one does have a problem then we can always uh, have access to that and we do have the ability to intervene uh, if there's a if there's an issue like the, uh, the our sister organization the financial management board one of its mandate is uh, to uh, act as an intervener to uh, act in the place of a of the chief and council uh, in terms of getting the uh, the treasury function that is to get the revenue stream back in order or 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 put another revenue stream in place Thank you very much, and, and, and both thanks to our, our our colleagues with these questions. Ernie, I actually have a question, and um, I've been following the FNFA for quite a few years now, and I'm really quite curious about the FNA's role as a stream bear for First Nations access to commercial capital. And of course, we've seen, especially with the um, the recent Clearwater deal that there's a much bigger awareness of FNFA and of basically the bankability of First Nations economic interests. I wonder if you could actually, you know, maybe discuss how this is really changing the perceptions of First Nations and from an investment interest. Uh, really, uh, I, 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 that's, that's a really good question. Um, yeah, so, it, Again, you know, I, I mentioned in the, in the PowerPoint uh, when I was talking a bit about UNDRIP, uh, about uh, other other governments, provincial governments uh, purchasing our, our debt. Uh, and uh, but right now we're we're uh, uh, we're we're in the we're in the municipal index, and most of the investors there are institutional investors. Um, so that uh, I. I, I I, from an investment point of view, like we are creating uh, opportunities for First Nations to invest some of their idle cash, their idle, uh, uh, their trust monies uh, through a mechanism that we're setting up. Uh, we worked, uh, I don't know if you're aware of the BC, uh, the Municipal Finance Authority of BC is really the model that we're, we're, we're structured on, but we did work with them at, uh, and are still are today in terms of uh, creating an investment environment. I. I I'm sorry, if you could repeat the first part of that, I uh, <laughs> I missed the first part of the question. I, I got into answering this one. Uh, <laughs> it's before. great, it's much appreciated. It's, I mean, really that um, the FNFA has been a stream bearer in so many different ways for First Nations to access commercial capital. And I'm just curious now that you're seeing what have really been like the, the broader impacts of that, especially in terms of you know, as First Nation leadership will come and speak to you about the other financial um, and investment interests that are now directly coming to them. Well, uh, that's a uh, yeah. I, I think that you know, it's uh, by having access to uh, capital at these really good uh, terms, uh, interest rates end term. Uh, through the uh, to the First Nation Finance Authority, really puts the First Nation in a better position to uh, negotiate, to to be a a, a better uh, uh, well a contributing partner of equal value, um, and uh, it it actually uh, really paves the way for other types of uh, um, business arrangements similar to the Clearwater, available to all First Nations across the country. 
Uh, for example, I, I, I mentioned the coastal gas link opportunity, but we are we are working with a number of First Nations in Manitoba right now that want to that are uh, looking at taking an equity interest in. Um, um, I think it goes to Winnipeg, I guess. Um, and in in if, and in the in the Atlantic Canada, there's other groups of First Nations looking at uh, acquiring an interest in other other uh, another industry. Um, um, Kind of related to, uh, not, I'd say the complete opposite of fisheries, but more into into uh, acquiring a casino, which is uh, uh, all, all the different. All the provinces have different ways of how they do gaming, and in the Atlantic, uh, they each uh, each uh, First Nation can host a casino and have their own uh, gaming commission. Uh, where in BC, it's all under the BC government. But uh, yeah, so we're seeing a number of those types of projects coming forward. So which is, which is good. So what it means is that First Nations can, sue, can pursue larger types of projects um, as well as uh, look at their own needs and, and their own priorities in their, in their, in their communities uh, to deal with the infrastructure because there's much needed infrastructure that needs to be done. Um, so yeah, so it, it really translates into creating jobs and uh, Really having a positive impact on the economy. Uh, there was a there was a study out in Manitoba done a few years ago where they looked at uh, uh, all the revenue that's generated um, from First Nations in that provinces and and how much uh, contributions the government made to social cost. Uh, and it uh, it was it was actually really an eye opener in that uh, First Nations are net contributors. To the economy, not net takers. So, uh, <clears throat> so that was uh, positive. So this only just increases that, and hopefully, it's going to lead to uh, really where First Nations are managing wealth as opposed to managing government funding projects, which is really keeping them more or less in poverty. So, uh, managing wealth uh, <laughs> compared to managing poverty, it's uh, uh, it's, it's it, it it does create that uh, really uh, opportunity for, for growth and for uh, um, uh, being able to manage their own uh, their own wealth. Uh, yeah, so uh, I think it's all positive all around. Bernie, thanks once again. I actually have another question coming from Ricardo. And, you know, as you've spoken about capacity in First Nations and communities are, you know, becoming more involved in these complex deals and executing transactions, how can the provinces, especially the province of British Columbia, basically meet the communities at this emerging and sort of growing level of capacity when you think, you know, the larger issue of sort of, especially the relationship between the province and the First Nations, in terms of actually how they often structure revenue sharing agreements or other sort of modalities? <clears throat> really good question because uh, really the, the, the one of the key ingredients to the continued success is the capacity. Um, we, we, we are aware that, you know, some smaller communities and there's, there's a lot in BC, there's 200 First Nations in BC, some of them have really small populations. Are not going to have the capacity to uh, look at uh, deals of this this complexity uh, and the magnitude of, of the size of some of them uh, are uh, well beyond what they're capable of doing. Um, I, I, I think uh, you know having um, I guess maybe organizations like the Major Projects Coalition, but you know in, in other fields. Uh, available to assist communities with expertise will, is going to be uh, really valuable looking in, into the future. And also our sister organization called the First Nations Financial Management Board is looking at a shared services model uh, where uh, they'll be they'll have access to the expertise on hand uh, to assist those smaller communities when they're looking at certain um, ventures. And, and even on reporting the results, their financial reporting um, and, and other types of reporting that's required. Uh, 
to provide that level of service to them as well. So uh, really the BC government can help uh, possibly uh, by uh, making those, uh, those resources available to either uh, funding, funding, uh, funding certain organizations or groups that are, are known to provide this type of services. And, uh, and also to really continue uh, uh, supporting First Nations uh, with, the, with the resources of the government. For example, like, uh, uh, you know, there's a, there's a big finance department in the, in the British Columbia government that probably has some expertise in dealing with the capital markets in other areas and that could really help First Nations in uh, looking at these type, uh, types of things. And you know, I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of engineers and a lot of other uh, experts that are uh, employed by the BC government, and that if if those can be made available, uh, or um, really to support institutions, other institutions to assist First Nations, we are actually looking at uh, incorporating another institute as a part of the First Nations Fiscal Management Act called First Nations Infrastructure Institute, which will do just that. It, uh, I think Jason Callow was on um, previously talking about the work of the First Nations Infrastructure Institute, and that's the primary purpose that, that they would they would undertake is to help those First Nations as they're going through infrastructure projects. Uh, and so, that, yeah, so that that's <clears throat> that's that's what I see. It's really you know a, a hand up rather than a handout in the in the, in helping First Nations and uh, until we get. The, our own expertise that's available to us in our community. So really thank you for that question. That's a really important question. Ernie, thank you very much. I think there's a really, there's a really important story about uh, the FNFA and how, you know, this, this now this ecology of service provided for the MFA and it's also for the consideration of all these loans. Could you talk a little bit about how your work, the work of the FN, FNFA, has actually started to create this broader ecology of service providers that are actually, I'm sure, there's going to have even more multiplier effect to the economy in general. Yeah. So again, that's that's really related to the capacity side that really needs to be developed. Like, uh, you know, I, I I look at the FNFA itself. Uh, we're unique. Uh, there's no other FNFA that exists anywhere else in the world, and uh, you know there are reasons for that. But uh, from the other countries, but uh, so what? What, the, what? What that really means is for us is that all the people that we've hired, we've had they 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 become the experts, right? And so we got to make sure that we're continually uh, uh, <clears throat> um, adding. Uh, you know, bright young uh, people uh, that can actually gain the knowledge that's required to run uh, an FNFA. And also we need to ensure that uh, we have succession planning in place, uh, which we do in, the, in terms of, uh, of how we operate. And so it's, it's kind of like that in, in, uh, <clears throat> and, and to really compensate people well, make sure that they're, 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 they're staying uh, um, with with the FNFA, they're growing with the FNFA, and uh, um, so that's and so that's as equally as uh, uh, as important to our communities is to um, to have a consistent uh, um, capacity in place um, so that uh, individuals can actually learn from and, and grow within the organizations for the experts that they need because. Uh, it, 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 and being able to fairly compensate and uh, make sure, making sure that uh, that that there's opportunities for uh, others to uh, move up and in, in uh, within our organization and the other institutions and the First Nations. So so that's what that's our plan right now. That's what the FNFA is doing, and where we we actually are hiring younger, uh, brighter individuals. Uh, and we're we're providing the opportunities for them to grow within the organizations, and we're really invested into our uh, succession planning because we know that's important. It's a skill that uh, is uh, really uh, needs to be uh, <clears throat> continually uh, uh, passed on to uh, uh, 
uh, all the employees that come with us and make make opportunities for them to and you know hopefully uh, when i'm retired that we have the uh, the right people to step into my position once once i'm gone and and having knowledge of the financial markets and how all of that deals how how do you deal with investors the uh, rating agencies the banking syndicate and uh, uh, those that are really important and on the other hand we we have to deal with the the different levels of government especially the federal government uh, uh, when they're talking about uh, amend, amendments to our act and having that aspect behind of uh, uh, the that legal aspect uh, and really having uh, <clears throat> skills of an economist uh, on our staff to to uh, look at how we're doing research or how we're in how we're contributing to policy development within Canada and the different provinces uh, it is really important. So uh, yeah, I, I think uh, it's, a, it's a great question. And uh, capacity is uh, is what, what's I, I, oh, part of our rating uh, from the different rating agencies. Uh, one third of our the element of our, our our credit rating is based on management and our ability to manage uh, uh, <clears throat> the the growth uh, and to ensure that. Uh, we're we're really uh, doing the proper due diligence and uh, monitoring to ensure that uh, uh, First Nations are going to still are not going to run into problems, or if, we, if if they are, we're identifying them earlier so we can do something about it. So it's it's all a big part of this uh, the success that we're that we're experiencing right now is uh, the capacity is this is important as all the other elements. Thank you, Ernie. Um, I think we've worked our way through all of the questions now, so uh, time to wind up our session. Um, please allow me to express to you our a collective appreciation for, for sharing the amazing success story of the First Nations Finance Authority and your insights on opportunities to collaborate on economic reconciliation. It's been a, a really interesting session. Great afternoon. Also, thanks to the audience for your interest and great questions. That concludes our webinar for today. Thank uh, you. Yeah, you're more than welcome. Thank you. And uh, we'll see you all next time. Bye for now.